Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Sex Podcast, a show that examines all aspects of sexuality, from physical to emotional to spiritual. Join our hosts as they discuss age-old questions, common misconceptions, and the latest topics surrounding sex. They'll tackle topics about sexuality from the complicated to the hilarious and everything in between. GSMC Sex Podcast is your show for all all of your questions about sex, even some you might not have thought of yet. everyone. Thank you so much for tuning back into the GSMC Sex Podcast. This is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Ainsley Caswell. Now, my goal in hosting a podcast like this one, covering a topic like sex, is to explore a topic that is not just interesting and predictable and titillating, which would be a little too easy, but to cover something informative because sex is something that is at the same time underreported and overreported in our society. It's undervalued and overvalued. And especially right now, and I guess you could say this about any time period in our history, we are zeroing in on a very specific element of sexuality and we're hyper-focusing on it, dissecting it, being overcritical of it, and many different areas are being misunderstood and misrepresented in our social interactions, our media, our generational gaps. It's happening in a lot of different areas. Decades ago, this began with some of the first women's movement, the first inklings of feminism. A little bit later, it happened with the first major movements of gay rights in the U.S., which was maybe mixed in with the second or arguably third waves of civil rights. And now, if I'm oversimplifying things, we're in some uh, second, third, fourth comings of feminism and gay rights all kind of mixed together in a major, major way. And we're mixing in a lot of different subdivisions of things like trans rights and a bunch of other things that people are discussing. What's getting mixed in here are conversations about violence because gun rights have become a much larger discussion than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago and violence against these populations of people. There's a conversation that seems to come up over and over and over again during these topics, and it's a conversation about a conversation that we don't seem to be having, and it's about bisexual invisibility. So although I don't personally identify as bisexual, I'm going to try to tackle the topic of bisexuality in more of an intellectual way and try to address some of these topics. I'm not going to speak about the topic in a personal way or try to identify with any of these topics personally, but I will try to cover them. So coming up today, I will try to divide the topic of bisexuality into three major areas, and that's misunderstandings about bisexuality, the rejections and hate that come along with being bisexual, and bisexuality versus other orientations, such as gay, pansexual, and asexual. There are others, but those are some of the big ones that come to mind when it comes to comparing bisexuality, which people tend to do. Finally, stick around at the end because I'm going to give you some examples of famous people who are bisexual, or at least have identified as bisexual, because we love to see it. Who does that feature? Is it Us Weekly? Celebrities, they're just like us. All jokes aside, really, it it does actually help our own personal 
frame of reference in the world, when we see people like celebrities who we tend to frame as godlike and otherworldly, it helps when they do or say things that we consider normal because it lets us know that the thing that we're doing or saying is normal too. Because this person that we've put on a pedestal is doing something that we do too. And if they say, oh no, I'm bisexual and it's normal and I go about my business, and they don't hate themselves, it may help us to not hate ourselves. So that's why people put a lot of weight on celebrities identifying themselves as not straight, not cisgendered, and that's why these things tend to get a spotlight put on them for anyone who's wondering. It also helps with the first topic that I was planning on tackling, and that's misunderstandings within this orientation. Because let's say that someone who is famous comes forward as bisexual, they get interviewed, or they're in the middle of an interview. Then they can actively answer questions about how they feel or how they conduct themselves under this label, and they can answer questions that a lot of people may be thinking. So what are those questions? Well, according to some of my research, some of the more common questions are the following. So are you into threesomes? You would think that a bisexual person would automatically be into threesomes, but bisexuality, as it's defined, simply says that someone is not exclusively attracted to one particular gender and or they are attracted to both men and women. That definition doesn't say anything about someone being interested in people sexually, simultaneously, at the same time, in multiple combinations. It doesn't say anything about that. Preferences having to do with your sexual acts are a completely different animal. That's like going up to a straight guy and hearing that he's straight and saying, oh, you must love blowjobs. Not only is it grossly inappropriate to just talk about someone's sexual preferences when you meet them and don't know anything about them, and also to jump to that conclusion once you realize what their orientation is, but once you realize that those two things are really not connected, you understand really how absurd that leap is. So the point being that to assume that someone enjoys or wants to get in on a threesome just because you discover that they're bisexual is invasive, rude, absurd, and doesn't logically make any sense. So according to bisexuals, the threesome question is very common and one of the most ridiculous ones that they get. Another one is, so trans people are a no-go for you? There's no rule book that said that, and no one anywhere in the bisexual handbook, which doesn't exist, stated that anywhere. Just because the definition of bisexuality lists men and women as a binary doesn't mean that bisexuals as a whole do not entertain the idea of dating or being sexual with trans people. I can only speak on this, again, from sort of an objective intellectual standpoint because, as a disclaimer, I am not a trans person and I have never been involved with a trans person romantically or sexually. But I think, like in most cases, this is a situation that is really a case-by-case basis between the parties that are directly involved. Anyone of any orientation has the right to dictate who they date and who they don't. And regardless of what your orientation is, whether you are straight, cis, trans, asexual, pansexual, gay, bi, any of those combinations, you will either meet people and like them or not like them regardless of what orientation they are. And as long as you're all honest with each other, you will ultimately make a decision of whether or not you want to date somebody. And bisexual people are a part of that population as well, and they will meet someone like them or not like them. There's no hard and fast rule with any group of people at large that says, 
no, we won't date that other large group of people. That doesn't seem to exist anywhere in any circle at all, period. So the bisexuals don't date trans people is a myth and it's not true and it's just not real. Similarly, on the other side, there is another common question that gets asked to bi people, which is, are you attracted to everyone? Similarly, that's also a myth and it's not real. Just because bisexual people are defined, again, as being attracted to men and women in a binary, because that's how the majority of the world is divvied up, it doesn't necessarily mean that they actually are attracted to everybody on the planet. Because the reality is, first of all, a human, any human, will never be attracted to everybody they meet, first of all. And second of all, the world is not actually literally divided up into a binary. We're just not. And civilized societies are only sort of now addressing this in our major societal conversations and trying to get past the oppressive practices towards these people because our societies really want us to live inside a binary. They desperately want us to. And we're trying to address the fact that biologically we we are not born that way. Two percent of the population is intersexed. And we've barely gotten to a point where we are acknowledging that. So if that is too much for you to acknowledge, just come at it from the perspective of If you're a straight person, do you find yourself attracted to 50% of the population? Oh, you don't. Well, bisexual people are not attracted to 100% of the population. They're just not. Because that's the question that you're asking them when you ask, oh, aren't you attracted to everybody if you're bi? It's a silly question. There is a question out there about bisexual people about them being more promiscuous And this seems to stem from the fact that they have more people to sleep with because they sleep with both sides of the population, as it were. And this doesn't seem to be true statistically. It's measurable. There have been a lot of studies on the LGBTQ population, including their sexual activity. And just like straight people, bisexual people generally just have sexual relations with who they want to instead of everyone unless they are forcibly raped. And bisexual people are roughly 50% more likely to be raped. So unless you look at that question from a very unhealthy perspective of sexual violence, bisexuals are not more promiscuous. There's a very strange question about, uh, are you bisexual because you're half gay and half straight? That's not really how orientation works. If you're asking this question, though, I think I understand what you may be trying to get at. And this might just be an, an issue with oversaturation of labels. The labeling issue, which has been happening a bit slowly, actually, through the years, has really tired out a lot of people who have become exhausted with not just learning, but accepting all of this terminology for these people who they think didn't exist and they need to accept now, when the truth is that these people existed, they just weren't public and they weren't letting anyone know they were around because they had to hide their activities and their lifestyles prior to this, and now they're trying to identify themselves. Some of this type of talk of, well, you're not bisexual, you're just half gay and half straight, that type of question seems to be an effort to just marry two different terms together and get rid of the term bisexual because people find it confusing and messy, and can't we just get rid of some of these terms that seem unnecessary because this whole thing is getting very oversaturated. I get it. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. But it doesn't make sense when it comes down to the fact that people are different and the way that people live are different. One more thing before we wrap up this topic, and it's the question of queer. 
sort of focusing in on the word, which is one more label. It's the question of, are you queer? And from what I understand, not just about this word, but about this question, and again, I'm speaking as someone who doesn't identify as this label, queer is a very generalized term, or at least it's become such. It's a word that has become a reclaimed slur. Where I feel that I see it the most, other than Instagram, is I see a lot of women using it. I do. And I don't know if those women otherwise consider themselves bisexual or gay or they like to use the term lesbian. I'm unsure. I do see men using it too, but I do see it used more generally rather than specifically. And people are typically using it for themselves. They don't call other people queer. They'll use it to identify themselves or they'll use it to describe their community or even their their lifestyle, essentially, or their aesthetic, which is now a very popular Pinteresty, Instagrammy word. So now I'll see somebody using it if they found if they if somebody found like a, a rainbow planter on Facebook Marketplace, I'll see I'll see them share it on their stories and say, "Look at this queer planter that I found that I'm going to put in my sunroom." You know, if you identify in the LGBTQ community, it's a word for you to use at your discretion. For just you can use it. It is no longer a word that someone can scream out of their car window at you in hate. And if they do, you can call the cops. Although maybe that's not always the best choice anymore either. It's up to you. It's up to you. I don't know who we call anymore. Ghostbusters, maybe. Hey, in part two, we're going to get into the rejections and hate that people face when they identify as bisexual and not the other letters in the LGTQ letters in the LGBTQ acronym. So stick around. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Folks, welcome back to the GSMC Sex Podcast. This is Ainsley, and today we're talking about bisexuality and all of the misunderstandings and complications. And in this segment, we're talking about some of the rejections and hate that come along with identifying as bisexual. If you are bisexual, this probably won't surprise you. But if you're not bisexual and you're not in the LGBTQ community, You might be surprised to find out that a lot of these feelings come from within the gay community. I haven't experienced a lot of these things myself, given that I am a straight, cisgender, white woman. Some of the only exposure that I've had to this type of thing is when I was younger and when I was mostly in the college ages. I was in situations where I was mostly trading my sexuality for alcohol, and for performative reasons, that usually just means girl-on-girl kissing in exchange for beer pong or body shots or something along those lines. That's not living your life as a bisexual, and that's not identifying as a certain orientation. Again, I use the word performative, so I won't use those as any sort of example. I have a few friends in different areas of the LGBTQ communities, and in different ways, they all talk about different kinds of toxicity exclusively within the LGBTQ community. And of course, there is toxicity and hate coming from outside, but they're referencing toxicity and hate inside. 
It gets very complex when you start talking about this type of toxicity and hate within, because it's very specific within the types of groups. The white men that I know who are gay, they tend to talk about body shaming and expectations among themselves, because they're largely competing against each other and comparing themselves to one another. There's a lot of negative connotations within how you view your own body versus your partners or people that you may be dating. There's complexes built up within yourself about how much you're working out or how much you're Instagramming about how much you're working out. The rise of social media with the rise of gay rights has undoubtedly complicated all of this in terms of how we're viewing each other and, again, how we're comparing one another to everyone else. Women seem to have a much more multifaceted set of issues where they're judging each other emotionally and superficially. They're judging each other not just based on looks, but also by their actions. I think everyone tends to struggle with this issue of, are you gay enough? And that's in particular where people who identify as bisexual struggle with the label when they present it to almost anyone in the LGBTQ circle. A very popular reaction that many people reference that they have faced is, you're not gay enough. And you can see that this is even like a meme or a trope where, oh, this is so gay, and that's a positive thing. This has risen essentially as a meme. There are stickers, there are graphics, there are phone covers, there are lots and lots of things that have been monetized and pushed out into the public that make it so you can identify yourself as a super gay person, your stuff can be gay, your lifestyle can be gay, and that is seen as very positive. But what about the people in between? Or even the people who identify as gay but don't necessarily want to brand themselves as that? What about those people? The label of inclusivity has now been skewed to mean something totally different than its actual definition. Inclusivity originally was meant to mean include everyone broadly. Now when people use it, it often means please include this one group exclusively. And that often doesn't make any sense. And like we've discussed on prior topics, it's often wielded as a weapon. So now people wield the term inclusivity as a weapon so that it excludes other people. Where this gets incredibly sticky is where groups of people who are preaching hate speech want to speak out against those who are using the inclusivity term incorrectly. So essentially, two groups of people who are both being selfish and oppressive are just fighting against each other and both getting a lot of news coverage. Again, in this cis white woman's viewpoint, I think the ultimate goal is to get to a point where we're not heavily dependent on any of these big labels, but we need them for the time being because we're not acclimated to recognizing any of these groups of people. But to get back to the original form of hate that we were talking about, we were talking about bisexuals being called not gay enough by their own community. And really what that's rooted in is the other categories of the LGBTQ community being oppressed for their entire lives, being told that they can't be gay. And then within the gay community, when bisexuals come in, those who identify as gay get offended that there are other people who don't identify the way they do, and they think they're being betrayed in one way or another, or they feel that their label is being watered down, and so they want people to align with them 100%. It's difficult for them to acknowledge that not everyone is like them. Either that, or they understand the concept of outsiders having a hard time understanding that not everybody is like them either, and they think it would be simpler to just present the idea that, hey, there's gay people over here, and they don't want to complicate things with bi, 
gay, and multiple labels within their community. But either way, this contributes to what we call bi erasure. And sometimes it gets to a level, if the person legitimately doesn't think that bisexuality is real, it will be elevated to someone telling the bisexual person, aren't you going to pick a side? That's another argument in bi erasure, is telling the bisexual person, you're going to pick a side, right? You have to pick a gender to eventually settle on. You're eventually going to pick either gay or straight. So which is it going to be? That argument is flat-out bisexual erasure because it is flat-out telling someone that bisexuality does not exist, that you cannot possibly, in the long term, maintain an attraction to multiple genders. The only way that the answer to that question is yes is if an individual who is bisexual has a desire to maintain a monogamous relationship in the long term then yes, they will eventually settle down with an individual and that individual will likely be of one gender. However, it won't actually change that person's orientation. That person who chooses a long-term monogamous partner will still have an attraction to whoever they are broadly attracted to, but their partner will remain their partner. An offshoot of this issue is when bisexual people do get a monogamous partner, people will approach them without questioning them and just state to them, oh, so you're this now. Like, if a bisexual woman settles down with a man, people will approach them and say, oh, so you're finally straight. Just because a woman is with a man doesn't mean that her orientation has been modified. There's also an argument of come out already if someone labels themselves as bisexual. Some people around them may just encourage them to come out as gay because identifying yourself as bisexual has been seen as just hedging yourself. Unfortunately, this can be true, but it's only true because of fear. And the fear is real. The fear is real because there is an actual apprehension and sometimes danger to identifying yourself as homosexual. To complicate the matter further, there is more apprehension with men identifying themselves as bisexual than there is with women. Some men will sooner identify themselves as gay than they will identify themselves as bisexual. Just to give you a personal anecdote, since I hope you realize that I am not a gay or bisexual man, when I was in my early 20s and I was living in Los Angeles, which is heavily populated with many people of different backgrounds and orientations, I was told explicitly by multiple men that it was a bit stereotypical and it was understood within, let's say, the West Hollywood community that gay men had a tendency to make out with girls when they were drunk. That's a stereotype and an overgeneralization, and I just heard it when I was working at a bar, and I didn't take it super seriously. And then it happened to me. It wasn't with a stranger or anything like that. It was a guy who I worked with who I thought had been flirting with me for months, but he didn't do anything. He didn't make a move. He didn't—I was very confused for a very long time. And then we were out at a work party. It was somebody's birthday— and then he got really drunk and walked me to my car and made out with me, but didn't do anything more. He didn't touch me in any way. He just made out with me and then went into his apartment, and then he didn't want to pursue it in any way, and we never spoke about it again. And this man was also very tight-lipped about his dating history, his sexuality, but it was heavily rumored that he was gay. And without jumping to any major conclusions and just offering that as a personal anecdote and my 20-ish years as a sexually active female, something like that has never happened to me on any other occasion. Oh, that's a lie. I made out with a gay friend of mine at a New Year's party, but I knew he was gay. I absolutely knew he was gay. But he made out with me on New Year's at midnight. But yeah, I knew he was gay, but he was a damn good kisser. 
The point being that there is a conversation in both intellectual communities and the casual LGBTQ community that there may or may not be a lot of men out there that would identify as bisexual if they were more comfortable, but they don't because there's risk there. There's a lot of risk, a risk that people don't even realize is more prevalent than it is. On the flip side, that's actually one of the talking points that I ran into, which is more girls are bisexual. Well, yeah, probably, because they're more comfortable identifying as such. Less men want to identify as bisexual because of the things that we've mentioned. If you wait until the end of the show, I am pretty sure we can identify more famous women who have identified as bisexual than famous men. When you hear of a famous man who identifies as bisexual, isn't it slightly more shocking? We don't hear about it nearly as often. When women come out as bi, or even as lesbians, it's not so much a good thing because it's overly sexualized, but it's received more positively. It is not typically shown in a negative light, at least not at first or overall. It's cast in a completely different light, a different tone is used, it's news that is delivered in a very, very different way. When we do find out about men who are bisexual or even just flat-out gay, we tend to find out about it when they're older. Why is that? It's because they keep it a secret. They didn't figure out that they were bi or that they were gay when they were 57. They hid it their entire lives. The first person that comes to mind is Rock Hudson. Raise your hand if you know who Rock Hudson is. I can't be the only person who studied old Hollywood. Okay, folks, I'm not, I'm not IMDb here, but Rock Hudson was a classic Hollywood actor of, you know, the 50s, 60s, that type of era. And then at the very end of his life, it was released to the public that he contracted AIDS and he was gay. N- no one knew about his sexual orientation except the immediate people in his life, in the industry, But no one who didn't need to know knew. No one else. And the industry kept it a secret. Even if it was sort of common knowledge within the film industry and the people that he worked with, everyone kept it a secret from the public because they knew that it was a risk to him and his career. And so did the people who tried to blackmail him. There were several It happened multiple times over the course of his 40-year career. So it's not something that's unknown to celebrities or people in entertainment or outside of entertainment. It still happens now with Lil Nas X. There's a great comparison meme that's floating around out there because of uh, some uproar that's out there with the single that Lil Nas X put out versus the other songs that are in the top 10 right now. Like, um, I, I guess the single that he that Lil Nas X put out is about doing cocaine. Uh, some of the other songs are uh, Save Your Tears by The Weeknd, which may or may not be about abusive relationships. Uh, Blinding Lights is still in the top 10, which um, I heard a breakdown of it. That also is part of, like, his concept album, which largely is about Abusive relationships and self-harm and drugs. Um, 3435, Ariana Grande. That's about aggressive screwing. Um, And what's the difference between these artists? Lil Nas X is gay. And the other two are not. That's the gist of it. So, when we come back, we're going to talk about the bisexual orientation and how it's different than being gay being pansexual, being asexual, and all of that. And in our last segment, we're going to identify some bisexual celebrities. Do you know who they are? Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
<laughs> from news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back, listeners. You are listening to the GSMC Sex Podcast, and I am Ainsley. In this hour, we are attempting to cover the very broad topic of bisexuality. In the first segment, we talked about general misunderstandings that can come along with being bisexual. And then we went into the not-always-fun topic of rejections and hate that can come along with being bisexual. And now I want to attempt to jump into what the orientation of bisexual can look like when it's held up against other orientations, like gay or pansexual or asexual, or maybe other lesser used terms like genderqueer or omnisexual or other things that maybe neither one of us have ever heard of. Demisexual is one that doesn't get used very often. So what do all these things mean, and do they also mean bisexual, and how do we use them accurately, or do we even need to use them? To start out, one of the things that will come up when we're talking about labels and the intense variety of labels that come up in this topic is, do we even need these labels? And we touched on this earlier. Because it intimidates people, it confuses people, it overwhelms people, and people say, why do we even need to do this? To be honest, the benefit of labels is largely for young people who are discovering who they are. There are a lot of questions out there now that the internet is a thing. You can see proof of an awful lot of young people asking very pointed, direct questions on different forums online that are about, I feel the following things, and I'm interested in the following things. What's my label? And the details of their stories are varied and different, but a lot of times their question is often followed by, I thought that I had this label, And then I brought it to my social circle or my friends or my school, and I was told I was wrong or I was bullied, and they told me I was something different, but this all feels wrong. So can you, the internet, please tell me what my label is? That in itself should show us that society is trying to put a bunch of people in boxes that don't authentically feel true. And there aren't enough boxes for all of the people that are organically out there in the wild. And so we are creating different types of subcategories and sublabels to fit all of these people that are out there in the wild so that they can label themselves with whatever feels correct. And then they want to, we want to, display those labels accurately so that Society then understands and can ideally accept those labels and then go forward using those labels accurately and respectfully rather than the antiquated labels and boxes that weren't accurate or respectful for everyone uniformly. So the phase that we're in now is people asking more questions, creating labels that are appropriate for them, and trying to inform people what those labels are and what works best 
for certain groups of people. I had an administrative job at a very liberal university several years ago. It wasn't my favorite job. And just because you have a job at a liberal institution doesn't mean that your life is going to be a cakewalk, I say from personal experience. However, I did have a meeting with the ombudsman of that institution regarding a problem I was having, and she made a statement during that meeting where she said, I think we're at a place in society where the pendulum is at one extreme, and eventually it's going to make its way back more towards the center. And she said that back in 2016. So we're in a transition stage, as if the Earth isn't always in a transition stage. But in a societal sense, we are in yet another massive transitional stage when it comes to sociological evolution and how groups of people are relating to each other. And our sexual identity is especially under major scrutiny and major, major evolution right now. And that includes these labels. So when we talk about things like bisexuality versus pansexual, omnisexual, and beyond that, let's start with basic definitions. Pansexuality is defined as romantic or emotional attraction towards people regardless of their sex or gender identity. So pansexual people are said to be gender blind. I remember working with somebody who identified as pansexual, and he literally said that he can be attracted to someone regardless of what was between their legs. That was the way he put it. Omnisexual seems to be an offshoot of pansexual, and it's defined as involving, related to, or characterized by a diverse sexual propensity. It's also defined as a sexual attraction to all genders, and if you try to research it, pansexuality gets brought up on a few different occasions. Demisexual is defined as being sexually attracted to someone only when you have an emotional bond with the person. Someone can identify as gay, straight, bisexual, or pansexual, but also identify as demisexual because it's dependent on the emotional connection. However, if you really think about that label, it massively discredits every other orientation by trying to inadvertently claim that every other orientation doesn't encompass an emotional connection at all. And that's the type of danger that we get into when we over-label things. When we over-label things and we separate out qualities that belong to certain labels, we inadvertently say that one quality only belongs to this label and doesn't belong to any other label. And those are the types of conversations that do happen on the internet. People don't always just encourage people or especially young people who are asking these questions to aggressively label themselves. There are not exclusively conversations that are happening either in real life or on the internet to just label yourself, wear a t-shirt with a label, tell everybody that you're this label, and you're just a part of this community, and that's that, and that's it, and segregate everybody and make sure you're fitting nicely into this bucket. Luckily, there are conversations that are happening, and there are people encouraging those who don't have their own labels and that are just coming up into their sexuality. There are encouraging conversations that are saying, you don't have to join just one of these labels, and you don't necessarily have to label yourself at all. There's a comment here left on one of these threads started by a confused young person, and I would like to read it to you. It says, Honestly, if you're more comfortable with one over the other, just use it. I tell people I'm bisexual because it's easier for many people to understand, and I feel like I'm explaining it to everybody, but I don't particularly prefer one over the other. I like girl parts, and I like boy parts. I'm just not picky about the origin, combination, or configuration thereof. People get too hung up on labels. I like sex with awesome people. Can I just be sexual without having to define how? 
Then there's people who acknowledge that these terms don't agree with each other and don't line up still today. Somebody else said, Pan and Omni are pretty much the same thing. For me, they're both extended variations of bisexuality, though Pan is used a little more commonly, and I think that's where you lie. You'll hear a lot from the LGBTQ folks that gender is fluid, meaning you can like vagina one day, penis the next, or both on days that you just can't choose. A lot of bisexuals have a preference of male and females, whether it's 60-40, 70-30, or even 90-10. Don't worry about labels, though. They'll just confuse you. So even within these communities, there is a fair amount of agreement that the labels themselves are not clearly defined, there is a lot of overlap, and there's not a whole lot of agreement about what they mean or how they are separated among each other. And people will still just latch on to the ones that work for them, but then once those labels and those people are out in the wild— especially within the LGBTQ community, there will be unhealthy discourse about who is what label and how do they work together. There's healthy discourse too, but it's getting to a place where it's all constructive and all healthy. And to be honest, I don't think we've gotten there yet. The one big term that we have not touched on yet is asexuality, and this is very separate for a big reason, because asexuality is defined as an orientation where a person does not experience sexual attraction towards anyone. Roughly 1-4% to of the population falls into this orientation. You can see from this number that it's relatively rare. If we turn this on its head and try to see it from another perspective, as we were talking about earlier, bisexual people are rarely, if ever, attracted to literally everyone. But it's a question they get asked on a regular basis. It's not normal, it's not frequent, and neither is asexuality, which is essentially the polar opposite of that concept. Asexuality is not a romanticism, meaning anti-romanticism. People who are asexual still participate in romantic relationships. They still participate in romantic acts of love. A asexual person is not anti-sex in the same way that a homosexual person is not defined by a belief that heterosexual sex is morally wrong, an asexual person does not believe that sex is bad for society. Asexual people generally do not have a lack of libido. Asexuality is an actual orientation. And similar to homosexual people having sexual relations with people who are the opposite sex for whatever period of time they choose, asexuals will sometimes choose to engage in sexual acts for various reasons, either because they're curious about sex, they want to reproduce, they want to experience physical pleasure with another person, they desire physical closeness, they have a partner that they want to connect with. All of these reasons an asexual person will choose to engage in sex despite their orientation. Or, also, like many homosexual people who engage with an opposite-sex partner before maybe coming out, they might not realize or accept their orientation. This can very easily tie into someone's identifying their orientation because someone can pre-identify as bisexual before they ultimately identify as whatever they really feel. And a good example would be someone who identifies as bisexual, has some experiences, and then ultimately figures out what they really feel. For example, if someone says, I think I'm bisexual, and then has some experiences, and then ultimately figures out, oh, I think I really am asexual. But it takes them a certain amount of time to get there. Or... Certain social stigmas put a lot of pressure on them to say things that are more appropriate or more accepted before they get to a place where they feel comfortable identifying themselves in a way that they really feel. 
This happens all the time in marriages and partnerships where someone is married, their partner has wants and needs that they feel pressured to fulfill, and then they get to a point where they can't keep something a secret or under wraps anymore. And this is one of the reasons that we think that we hear of LGBTQ labels later in life. It's often because people feel the need to keep things a secret in their younger years when they have more pressures and expectations put upon them. I would imagine this is especially true for those who identify as asexual because there is a very high expectation in many societies to produce children. And depending on what your wants and needs are as a person who may or may not be asexual, who knows if you even want children and then to get them, do you even want to participate in the making of those children? I can't answer these questions for you. That's not, that's not what I'm here to do. What I am here to do is give you some names of celebrities who were willing to tell all of us publicly that they identify as bisexual. Stick around and I'll give you some of those names. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the GSMC Sex Podcast. This is, of course, Ainsley, and we are finishing up our hour-long discussion on bisexuality. As promised, I'm wrapping up the discussion by going through a list of some celebrities that have self-identified as bisexual, which is something that you don't always hear a lot about. So rather than rattle off a list of names from a BuzzFeed article at you, which won't eat up a lot of time either. I'm going to try to find some interviews, quotes, things that these people have actually said, because that also helps to put things in perspective. And as we've sort of discussed ad nauseum, these situations are all very different. One label doesn't cover everything, and a lot of these labels overlap. So I want to kick this off with someone who fits into no box anywhere, Janelle Monae. She's a style icon, a musician, everything that you could possibly want in an artist of any type. In a 2018 Rolling Stone interview, Janelle Monet said, Being a black, queer woman in America, someone who has been in relationships with both men and women, I consider myself to be a free-ass motherfucker. Later, I read about pansexuality, and I was like, oh, these are things that I identify with, too, and I'm open to learning more about who I am. And apparently, she said this after identifying as bisexual. So this is a really good example about labels having no set parameters and people learning more about labels and broadening their labels or changing them. Next, Demi Lovato popped up on my radar, which I personally wasn't expecting, and that might be just because I don't follow her on purpose. It's not that I'm not a fan or anything. She's just not really on my radar. And I believe Demi Lovato sparked up bisexual rumors first a few years ago when her single Cool for the Summer came out because that was— it, it had a very bisexual narrative. It was very clearly focused on a female listener, and the entire storyline of the song was about a fling during the summer between two women, 
Demi and the listener, and it was speculated that it was going to be temporary and it was just a summer hookup. So Demi never confirmed or denied this. Then her ill-fated documentary going through 2017 to 2018, which of course kind of fell apart due to her substance abuse, which is now coming to light because of her revived and new documentary, which is being trickled out on YouTube. I'm in the middle of consuming it. Apparently, that original documentary was teased very, very lightly to contain a little bit more information about her sexuality. That was never followed through with, not just because that doc itself didn't get finished, but Demi's sexuality has never really been the focus of her fame or her media attention. It's really been the other stuff in her life. Now, there seems to be some confirmation from Demi herself where she sat down for an interview on January 30th, 2021, and she said that in 2017, she sat down with her parents and talked to them about potentially seeing herself, quote, ending up possibly with a woman. And she continued, quote, it was actually like emotional, but really beautiful. After everything was done, I was like shaking and crying and just felt overwhelmed. She also said, My mom was the one that was like super nervous about, but she was just like, I just want you to be happy. I don't know what my future looks like. I don't know if I'm going to have kids this year or in 10 years. I don't know if I'm going to do it with a partner or without. This is where she gets pretty serious about, about uh, sexuality and stuff. She also said, I'm very fluid. I think love is love. You can find it in any gender. I like the freedom of being able to flirt with whoever I want. So I'm not an expert on Demi Lovato at all, but I suppose she was rumored to be dating people like Ruby Rose and Lauren Abedini between the years of 2011 to uh, right up until roughly her overdose. But I actually wasn't privy to any of that. And I don't know how serious it was or if she ever confirmed it. It sounds like she did not. And these statements roughly about a month ago, month and a half ago, are really her acknowledging that she's living more or less a bisexual lifestyle or making bisexual choices at her discretion and we should be cool with it. And we should. So that's that. I'm going to skip over Ellen DeGeneres, not just because we already know and that's old news, but you know. Abby Jacobson, I don't actually think I know who she is, although maybe I do because she looks familiar and maybe I follow this girl on Instagram. I don't know. I guess she's from Broad City, but I don't watch Broad City. So if you know who she is, I'm glad. If I know who she is, I'll be even more glad because <laughs> I don't watch her show and I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, apparently she's on Broad City, which it's I've heard good things about this show and I probably should watch it. She says, I kind of go both ways. I date men and women. They have to be funny, doing something they love. I don't know. I've never really been interviewed about this before. Shocking, because most actors and actresses are, like, bombarded with questions about their intimacy and their love life. So I'm glad she hasn't been interviewed about this before. But it's also good that she gets to speak on this on a more low-key basis. So... Good for her. I'm including this next guy not because I know who he is, because I don't, or because he identifies as bi, because I don't think he does, but because of the pull quote that I have in front of me, uh, because it, it's very poignant and I enjoy it a lot. His name is Ollie Alexander, and I believe he's from a band called Years and Years, which, if I'm not mistaken, appears to be a British band, and I'm not familiar with him or the band, so I'm sorry about that. And I'm not 100% sure how he identifies, but this is what he has said. As queer people, we're used to the narrative that you're in the dark, in the closet, then you come out, which can be a traumatic process. Once that's over, there's a pressure to prove to everybody how happy and successful you can be, and that you aren't scarred or damaged. No one's saying being gay gives you mental health issues. It's growing up in a world that makes you feel like you're wrong, disgusting, or perverted. I don't think I need to close that out with anything else. Aubrey Plaza. 
Aubrey Plaza, of course, uh, is an actress. She is sort of famous for being on Parks and Rec. And she has said, I know I have an androgynous thing going on, and there's something masculine about my energy. Girls are into me. That's no secret. Hey, I'm into them too. I fall in love with girls and guys. I can't help it. Uh, Fall in love with this, Aubrey Plaza. Um, I'm going to touch on Nick Grimshaw for a moment. He's a British TV presenter, and although he does seem to identify as gay and not so much bisexual, he has talked about an early phase of his life when he was sleeping with girls, and he said, It was fine. It wasn't horrible. Some of my gay friends can't touch a bra, but I was never like that. I wasn't repulsed, but it didn't feel natural. It felt like it was an effort, like, oh, maybe I'll touch her hair now. It felt like acting. So here is an excellent example of people that are going through a portion of their life where they're figuring things out, they're going through the motions, they're not really sure what they're supposed to be doing, because a lot of our actions are often dictated by social expectations. Next, I I had to Google this girl's name because I don't follow Fifth Harmony. Lauren Horegi. I'm I'm so sorry. I'm I'm an old person now. I'm I apologize. It doesn't matter though because this is the best thing I've ever read. After Donald Trump's election, apparently Lauren Horegi was so upset she wrote an open letter to Billboard that said, "I am a bisexual Cuban American woman, and I am so proud of it." We stand. We we stand all day long. Drew Barrymore. I think I already knew this. Uh, and I think this was news that came out a long time ago. Drew Barrymore said, A woman and a woman together are beautiful, just as a man and a woman together are beautiful. Being with a woman is like exploring your own body, but through someone else. When I was younger, I used to go with lots of women. Totally. I love it. I'm reading this, and I actually, and it's not cited, so I don't know when or where she said this. All right, Google is my friend. I can date this back to 2003. So yeah, this is quite old, almost 20 years. You're welcome. Thanks, Google. Amanda Stenberg, who is a Hunger Games actress, once said on Teen Vogue's Snapchat, apparently, As someone who identifies as a black bisexual woman, I've been through it, and it hurts, and it's awkward, and it's uncomfortable. But then I realized because of Solange and Ava DuVernay and Willow and all the black girls watching this right now that there's absolutely nothing to change. And hopefully what she means by that is that she is realizing that she doesn't need to conform and that there's other models out there right now existing in the world peers of hers that are already examples for her to follow. I hope that's what she's getting at. Cara Delevingne is next on my list. And I remember in the very few episodes I've produced so far, I've already mentioned that I have sort of a deep admiration for Cara Delevingne. (laughs) And not just because she's one of St. Vincent's exes, who I also have a deep, deep love for, but uh, Cara Delevingne has, uh, has, a lot to say on the topic of identity and sexuality. And I already have sort of a lengthy quote in front of me, but I even just want to take a a tiny section of it where she says at the end of sort of ranting about people being confused about her talking about identity, where they ask, so are you gay? And she's like, no. And they're like, so what are you? It's like, well, what is it even? Shut up. And she says at the end, imagine if I married a man people would be like, she lied to us. Because the whole point is things evolve and things change, and there isn't really one label that covers everything universally. So how about everybody just shut up? That's me summarizing. Cara Delevingne didn't say shut up, at least not in this thing that I'm looking at. She may have said it at a different time. She only said, it, she only said imagine if I married a man, people would say she lied to us. That's all she said in the thing that I'm looking at. But in general, I endorse Cara Delevingne. Kasha, Kasha, we also stand a Kasha. Kasha has said, I wouldn't say I'm gay or straight. I don't like labeling things anyway. I just like people. I don't love just men. I love people. It's not about a gender. It's just about the spirit that exudes from that other person you're with. That does sound very Kasha, doesn't it? 
Halsey. Hmm. In 2015, Halsey said, I'm bisexual, so it's my opportunity to take heteronormity out of this world of media and culture and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. She continued, and also, I just wanted to piss off Capital because they were like, cool, we're going to cast you a guy. And I was like, fuck you, don't assume that I want a guy in my video, fuck off. Oh, we also stan a Halsey, I think. It's official. Miley Cyrus. In 2016, Miley Cyrus said, My whole life I didn't understand my own gender and my own sexuality. I always hated the word bisexual because even that is putting me in a box. I don't ever think about someone being a boy or someone being a girl. My eyes started opening in fifth or sixth grade. My first relationship in life was with a chick. That's interesting because I think I've heard almost no coverage about Miley Cyrus's sexuality at large. And maybe that's because she was in such a long-term relationship with one of the Helmsworths. I honestly can't remember which one, but maybe that was why. But I don't think I've heard any coverage on that. You may have noticed so far that this list is almost exclusively women, and the men that I've included on it have largely, at least to the best of my knowledge, identified as gay. So I had to specifically go in search of bisexual, well-known, famous men. Some of the ones that float to the top of the list are often musicians. A lot of actors still seem to keep it under wraps. Music seems a little more accepting and has been for a really long time. One of the ones that comes to mind without any research at all is Freddie Mercury, and I might be able to get a little more detail on that later. Billy Joe Armstrong, though, is one that came to the top of my list that, honestly, I wasn't, I don't think I was previously aware of this, and it doesn't seem to be well publicized or talked about. And he apparently began discussing it in 95. And a quote from 95 in an interview is the following. He said, I think I've always been bisexual. I mean, it's something that I've always been interested in. I think people are born bisexual, and it's just that our parents and society kind of veer us off into this feeling of, oh, I can't. They say it's taboo. It's ingrained in our heads that it's bad. When it's not bad at all, it's a very beautiful thing. Since, he's become a pretty strong advocate specifically for things like biphobia because he's a living proof that it's especially prevalent with men. He's written some material about it. It doesn't seem like a strong piece of inspiration in their material, but you can see it referenced in at least uh, at least what I'm reading in their song Coming Clean, which is on some early work. Uh, I guess it's from an album in 94. <gasps> Jason Mraz. Oh, I legitimately didn't know about this and have never heard anything about this. My goodness. I've been a fan for a while. I've been in love with this man for a while. Wow, I've never heard anything about this. Okay, um, mm, in a quote um, or in an interview with Billboard, he said, I've had experiences with men even while I was dating the woman who became my wife. I was like, wow, does that mean I'm gay? And my wife laid it out for me. She calls it two-spirit, which is what the Native Americans call someone who can love both man and woman. I really like that. Well, then, there's certainly a lot to be said. Thank you, first of all, Jace Mraz, for um, accidentally shoehorning some multicultural education into this podcast. There's a lot of information out there about other cultures and how they treat different sexualities. And just one reason that I didn't dive into it here was because of time. And the second one is because I'm not a scholar on the subject, and I think I'm a bit underqualified to do that. And I also, at this time, don't really have the resources to bring in people who are experts on the subject. So while it's a relevant topic to discuss in regards to human sexuality and the topic of orientation and identity. It's not something that I chose to cover just within this hour. It's definitely a decent topic that I may be able to cover for a whole different episode, but I didn't think it was fair to try to shoehorn it right alongside all of these other more 
uh, sociological topics. But I appreciate how covering Jason Mraz's sexuality kind of accidentally brought it into the narrative. And then when we get into other names, we start seeing older actors that aren't around anymore. And I don't know if that's such an accident because these are men who, frankly, don't have anything to lose anymore. We have Marlon Brando, Leonard Bernstein, Cary Grant, Pete Townsend. So not just actors. We have entertainers of all type. David Bowie. David Bowie's sexuality was kind of known, and he spoke about it at length. Montgomery Clift. Leslie Hutchinson. This is where we start to hear the argument of like, oh, only older people experiment with their sexuality. And no, they were likely doing that and or felt that way when they were younger. They just didn't say anything to anybody because they had more at risk. Their lives were more precarious. They were establishing their careers. They had relationships they were afraid of losing. Maybe their parents were still alive and they were concerned about upsetting them. There's a good chance they were married. There's all sorts of reasons that people are either dishonest or confused about what they're doing and they make the choices they make. I know I didn't include everybody. There's a bunch of people that uh, I could have listed that I either didn't find or missed or just uh, didn't appear on the list that I happened to make or find. So if you wish that I would feature somebody or you wanted to hear somebody's name and you didn't, you're more than welcome to send it to me. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Sex Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Remember to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review, and sign up for notifications so you never miss new episodes. And if you want to send me the names of the people you wish I had listed in this segment, follow us on socials like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and slide into my DMs. You can search GSMC or my name, Ainsley Caswell. Thank you. See you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sex Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From sex and relationships to health and wellness, life and happiness, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Sex Podcast.